scripture reading for this morning is Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 15. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man who made me a judge or a divider over you. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of con- coventious, for a man's life consisteth not of abundance of the things which he possesseth. taking the time to hand me the microphone. I about forgot about it. But uh, we live in a treasure-mad society. We have Ponzi schemes, frauds, people trying to hack into bank accounts. Maybe you've had people calling and saying, oh, you need to send us money because you missed jury duty. They will call people and say, well, you need to send this or you'll go to jail. And basically, it's going into their own account. We see family relations and friendships being affected every day by greed, by avarice, by covetousness. And stepping on others to attain riches can, ca- can hurt not only other people, but can cost us our souls. And the lesson title is Thou Fool, and that is in Luke, the 12th chapter. Luke 12 and verse 13, I appreciate Dylan's reading. And one of the company said to him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What's the issue? Well, in verses 13 through 15, it's a family dispute. You know, Divide the inheritance. Somebody's not being, somebody's not on the up and up on inheritances. And that happens a lot in families. You know, I've, I've, I've joked before about having a family situation in which, oh, well, let's get grandma's stuff. And I said, you know, some family members took everything that wasn't nailed down. And for the other things, they brought a claw hammer. And we laugh about it. But, you know, there are people who live like that, who act like that. And we, it's still a common problem. Often it involves a breach, breach of trust over, you know, material things. But all the money and treasure might be wonderful, but one day it's going to burn up. That's a depressing thing in itself. You know, Second Peter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. 
what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. So, all the things that we might have, all the glorious things, you know what's going to happen to everything on Judgment Day? It's all going to burn up, no matter how valuable it is. You know, I don't know what's valuable in your family. And over the years, I was talking to Austin about, you know, going through all the stuff and what's valuable and what's not valuable. And I said, you know, we're going to go through all this stuff and it's all going to burn up if it doesn't get burned up already. My sister is talking about, okay, I'm going to get a dumpster put it in the driveway, and we're just going to put everything that we can't sell in a rummage sale in it. And I'm like, okay, let's see what we do. And, I, you know, we were talking about, I said, didn't mom have these mixing bowls and a, one that she used for gravy? And she said, yeah, it was very old, It was, and it was nice to have. And my sister had to admit she dropped it in the sink and it broke in a million pieces, you know. How valuable is it now? I've seen those in the, in the antique shop. So if I really want to get one, I can just go to an antique shop and find someone with that gravy bowl. And Sheila did fix biscuits and gravy this past week. And you know what? I think it's the first time we've had biscuits and gravy or any kind of gravy for probably six months, maybe longer. In other words... How bad do I need that gravy bowl? And in twelve, you know, we, in verse fourteen it, of, of Luke twelve, it says, you know, Jesus says, "Who made me a judge or a divider over you?" Now, really, was it was it Jesus able to mediate? Who has more authority ever walked this earth than Jesus? He, he, he could have done that, but he certainly had the authority. But in verse fifteen. Jesus warns against covetousness, which is to desire selfishly, to desire things that you don't have the right to. You know, we talk about a man coveting a woman's, a man's wife, you know, someone else's wife. You know, you don't have the right to that. And Jesus says, our lives do not consist of what we possess. You know, what's the old saying? He who dies with the most toys wins. No, you just don't have the toys to play with anymore. You know, you put things in coffins and people are saying, well, you want to bury this with them? And I'm like, well, not going to be used anymore, is it? You know, you, when you lay in the coffin and you've got all your stuff on, if they say, well, I want dad's wedding ring, what, what is dad going to do? He's dead. You take the wedding ring, he's not going to say, stop that, you thief. He's dead. I remember Brother Earl Robertson talking about going to a funeral, and they said, yeah, the grandson wanted Grandpa's belt. He said, so the deceased didn't even get, ha, keep his belt to keep his pants on. Okay, he's laying in the coffin. He's not going to fall off. But we see these things. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4, it says, He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, wherein cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and fall after righteousness, goodness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You know, we need to have, take care of what we want, and realize what we need. It sounds like when you go on a diet, 
or when the doctor says you need to go on a diet. It's not what you want, it's what you need to do. In other words, hope you enjoy delicious food. We, you can't eat it ever again if you want to live, you know. And it's hard to go through that, you know. And what good is treasure if we lose our souls? You know, in, in James, the second chapter, in verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, well, if you say to them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which you, are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith that hath not works is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith by without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The, de the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son up, you know, upon the altar? In other words, are we, you know, what God, what good is treasure if we lose our soul? You know, I could, you know, I have a, you know, I, I'll get a supervisor and they'll say, is there anything, you know, what can I get for you? And I always smile. I go, you want to get me something? Kruger Ends. Now, not everybody knows, I've, I've discovered that not everybody knows what a Kruger Rand is. I had to explain Kruger was a president of South Africa and they put his face on a gold coin and their, their measure of money is called a Rand. So, Kruger is on the Rand. It's gold. And I said, oh, if you want, they said, I, I had to look it up, Rich. And I go, well, they used to have commercials for it in the late 70s, you know, oh, buy Kruger Ands. <coughs> but if I have Kruger Ands, and trust me, I, I don't have any. If I did, I'd probably have a lot more things, but I don't. You know, Matthew 16 and verse 24, you know, talking about to gain the world. Verse 24, then said Jesus to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Too many put earthly gain over everything else. And we know people like that. You know, we need to put those things to death you know, put the desires for things that can only help us for a little while. You know, it's like I offer you a job. And I say, okay, I'll offer you a job. Which one do you want? The one that's temporary? You'll have a, month, you'll have a job for six months? Or I'll give you one and you can have it until you retire. Which one would you take? Well, you're going to take the one that lasts longer. If you have the treasures of this world, it's only going to last until the world burns up. Colossians 3 talks a little bit about that. Colossians 3 and verse 1, If you, thou be risen in, with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall... You also appear with him in glory, mortify, in other words, put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, 1 Timothy 6, it talks about the love of money. It's the root of all kinds of evil. And we see... In particular, in 1 Timothy 6, in verses 17 and 19, you know, what happens if you have that kind of wealth? Well, verse 17, it says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, 
nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. We have additional responsibilities if we have more money. We need to take care of others and realize that we can help a lot of things that are righteous, help a lot of people who are in need. You know, they talk about, you know, when I watch people saying, well, they, someone spent so much money on Super Bowl tickets, and I said, I wonder how many poor families that didn't get to eat their meal because they didn't have enough money or resources on Super Bowl Sunday would have killed for $10 just to get a, a couple of burgers at McDonald's. And people are spending thousands of dollars so they can watch. I, you know, I have to think a minute. Who played that game? Who won? You know, it's like ask, you know, I'm not a football fan, you know. Yes, uh, they said in 2016, yes, the Cubs won the World Series. Who won it in 2015? Oh, the Kansas City Royals. Why do I know that? Well, some things are more important than others. But in the end, what good is it? Who won the World Series in 1919? The Cincinnati Reds. How do I know that? We went to the Cincinnati Reds Museum and Hall of Fame, and they had the, the ball from the last out of the 1919 World Series. That's the Black Sox World Series. The Black Sox, some of the players took bribes to throw the game so that the gamblers could make more money. You know what a 100-year-old baseball looks like? It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not crisp. You can tell it's been around the block a few times. And that ball is going to burn up, even though it's proudly presented in the Hall of Fame in the museum. But it's going to burn up. Are we rich? Are we wealthy? We have responsibilities if we do. And need to take care of others. That's something, you know, with my, I don't know if we're going to get any money or not from my mom's passing and dad's passing, but we still have to deal with it. And if I come out with a little extra money, I, I need to take care of some things. I've got responsibilities, and we have additional responsibilities if we have it. Again, on Judgment Day, if, I walk, if I'm called to make account and I said, well, I had this much in my bank account, what the Lord's going to say, I made the money. I made gold, I made silver, I made diamonds and jewelries and you know, all kinds of things. In other words, God doesn't need it. What he's going to ask us is, what did you do with your life? What did you do about your sins? You know, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 1, Paul talks about those who take other Christians to court. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. In other words, think of the weakest Christian you've ever seen. And Paul is saying, you know, the one that barely goes. Might come a couple days a year, you know, to punch his, his or her ticket. And Paul says, you know what, that person's more qualified to judge between Christians than people who are not Christians. He says, is there not a wise man among you? Verse 5, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goeth to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Yea, you do wrong. 
and defraud, and that your brethren. Why is it wrong to do that against a fellow brother or sister in Christ? Well, first of all, one, it, it puts our trust to outsiders, those who are not in a saved condition. Secondly, the, the least of the Christians is a better person to judge, as we mentioned. Thirdly, it looks bad to outsiders. They're going to say, why can't they get along? And they'll use it as an excuse not to believe. And it also asks us, are we the light of the world when we act like that? You know, Matthew 5 and verse 13 in the Sermon on the Mount what does Jesus say that we need to be doing? He says, you are the salt of the earth, verse 13 of Matthew 5, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salt? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Are we the light of the world? And in verses 7 and 8 of 1 Corinthians 6, it's just simply wrong. If we believe Paul as an inspired writer, as an apostle of the Lord, what he says is the law of God. If we don't follow what Paul has written, we're in trouble. I haven't seen any of these lately on License plate brackets or what are the things you put on the bumper? A bumper sticker. What would Jesus do? WWJD. You know, Jesus told the man in dispute with his brother to not be foolish, but to instead prepare for judgment. So what do we need to do? In Matthew 5, but in verse 21, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But this I say unto you. What does he say? That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, in other words, you know, a, a graceless wretch, wretch, say that five times, shall be in, without, you know, Thou shalt be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou shalt and thou be cast in the prison. Verily I say unto you, unto thee, thou shalt by no means come not thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. If our worship is affected by when someone has something against us or we have something against them, we need to reconcile with our brother and sister to give to the Lord with a right heart. And do we have conflicts with one another? If you, had, if you had siblings and you grew up together, oh yeah, you get, you know, I had a little sister, so, you know, we get in a fight, I'd hit her, she'd run, Rich hit me, and I was such a smart kid. I would stay on the property and hide in the same place every time. You know what? They kept finding me. But, you know, we can overcome that. Romans 12 and 16, you know, what does Paul say? Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to why men of low estate be not wise in your own conceits recompense to no man evil for evil provide things honest in the sight of all men if it be possible as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Even if we are wrong, it's the Lord who will take care of it. 
Not you, not me. We don't have Christian hitmen. Can you imagine Christian hitmen? You know, who do, who do we get today? You might not want to come to the services if that's going to happen. And you know what? Romans 3.23, for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. There's nobody who would be safe if we had something like that. We need to pray for all men, not pray against them. 1 Timothy 2, it says in verse 1, I exhort, therefore, Paul writes, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, not just the men and people who have done good to you, but those who have e done evil to you. And, which it means is we need to even pray for those who have done us wrong. You know, verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's hard. If anyone's done you wrong, oh, You want to get the trap door with the crocodiles under it and go, down you go. But you know what? That's not what the Lord wants us to do. We need to help those people get over their sin at lest we get drawn in with them. 1 Timothy 3 and 3, you know, was a, 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 an elder not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, in other words, dishonest gain, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. You know, lucre, you know, you know, filthy lucre means dishonest gain. Just because we might need to be forgiving, praying for those who may have wronged us does not excuse the guilty party, though. They need to repent also. What does Jesus say in Luke 13, 1 through 5? In, ver in verse 1, it says... There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said to them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt at Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In other words, not to be foolish. You know what? When people ask you, what would you do with, if you had all the money you needed or more? And I said, well, I'll pay my debtors. Probably ought to pay my electric bill because I do want to be able to see at night. But you know what? That's the things I was talking about. Well, if I get so much money from mom, I'll pay this loan off and I'll Pay for my burial plot. It just, that's the curse of Adam. It just goes around and around and around. Man has to deal with death. And we have to prepare for death as well. And if we're thinking about only temporary riches, what good is it to us if we get all the riches, no matter how we got them, and we lose our soul over it? It is better to take the loss. It is better to starve to death than to lose your soul because you, you stole the food. Let us not be foolish, not to lose our souls for earthly gain. We need to work for heavenly gain. So have you heard the word, you know, in Romans 10, 17, you hear the word. Or if you can't hear, you read it. Then you believe it, Mark 16, 16. He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. To repent as we just read in Luke 13 and also Acts 2, 38. To confess as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts 8. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God. To be baptized for the remission of our sins and in Revelation 2, 10, to be faithful unto death. Where do we stand this day? Are we in a situation where our souls are in danger? Where we're allowing our, ourselves 
to get involved with these things. We need to do, take care of it before it's everlastingly too late because the Lord's not going to care how much money we had. It's, were you my servant? Did you serve me? And we can do so much in the Lord's service by letting heavenly gain overcome earthly. That's our lesson. There's been an invitation song selected. If the invitation applies to you in any fashion, please come forward. Make your wants known while we stand and sing.